when the blood in your veins written to the sea, and the earth in the bones written to the ground. Perhaps then you will remember that this land does not belong to you. It is you who belong to this land. This is the philosophy of the land. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Organizing Committee, for having me here. Even though I'm just a recent graduate, I'm grateful and I'm overwhelmed by your presence here. As a footnote, I'm good, not going to bore you much. I don't take much time. First of all, my apology to everyone present here. Since I might not be in the position to give a scholarly analysis of the topic and title, noun caste societies, epistemology, and challenges in India. Nevertheless, I shall throw some perspective on society who are outside the category of caste, noun by the name tribes in India. I think today is the right platform to discuss about indigenous people in India on this very auspicious International Day of the World Indigenous People. Broadly, one could locate three perspectives in academia emanating from the discourse on tribes in India. First, perspectives stemming from colonial anthropologists, Western slash caste nationalism, which constitute perspective from above, which is a dominant narrative in today. The subaltern studies position could be located as perspective from below. The third, an emerging perspective, which we at the Tribal Intellectual Collective in India call as perspective from within. I shall illuminate from this third perspective, that is perspective from within. However, before I engage further, it is imperative to state my epistemological location as a researcher. As it is from this location that I draw my perspective and analyze my data. I belong to the Pumai Naga tribe, which is recognized as one of the chief tribes by the government of India, located in the state of Manipur, Northeast India. India is home to the largest indigenous population in the world, accounting to 104 million people with more than 705 ethnic communities. There are constitutional provisions, phenomenon of laws and policies to protect the rights of the indigenous people which commonly now as the tribes in India. However, it is an irony that India is also distinguished by the extreme reluctance of the government to acknowledge or accept the international framework for such protections embodied primarily in International Labour Organization Convention No. 169 of Indigenous and Tribal Peoples, 1989. And the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, 2007. Well, India is a signatory to ILO Convention 107 on Indigenous and Tribal, uh, tribal Population, the predecessor to Convention 169 and voted in favor for the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. It has undermanly insisted that its own people cannot claim status of protection under this law. Such is the reality in India. Here, I'm going to make an argument based on the line of Bodhi Yasser in 2017 that identity is a caste state. It is not a neutral state, but a caste state. One way to analyze this aspect is to look at Indian social reality from the binary of caste and non-caste society. There are two types of communities in India, that is caste and non-caste communities. What dominant right now is a caste community, our non-caste community. The state is actually taken by the caste community, not only caste, but caste. Everything about non caste society is decided by caste society. This has a bearing on tribes in India and partly explains why Shadow tribes are always at the bottom of any development indicators. We can have a quick glance of some basic facts and figures. Tribes constitute 8.6% of the total Indian population. The literacy rate of the tribe, according to the 2011 census, is 58 percent as compared to 72 percent for the general population. 
If you look at the student drive enrollment in higher education, it's merely 4.3% of the total travel population in the country. Moreover, as per the National Family Health Survey 2005-06, the infant mortality rate was 62.1 per thousand lifers among tribes. And under 5 mortality was as high as 95.7 per thousand life births. <coughs> it is estimated that from 1951 to 1990, mega development projects such as dams, mining, life, wildlife sanctuaries, and factories have displaced over 21 million people in India. Out of this 21 million, 8.54 million have been must tribal. Thus, tribal constitute about 40% of the total displaced population, even as they comprise less than 9% of the total population. Tribes in India are the most marginalized society. One need to problematize the Indian state approach to development. Since independence, the administrative division has been rearranged from time to time with a view to address development as well as social identity issues. In spite of such rearrangement, the development status of India has been far from uniform. India's development experience points to a scenario of extreme disparities and segregation. Tribes in India did not find any place at the upper echelon of any department in India, and they continue to be marginalized in their narratives are considered as inferior, which are not worth for any discourse. Tribes are not only marginalized and displaced in the realms of development, but more perversive is the case of the epistemology and theory produced from such location that are subject to various forms of marginalization and invisibilization, experiencing exclusions and inferiorization. In India, the term tribes have been used pejoratively by non tribes in manifestation of extreme cultural racism. Over the 20th century, tribes have been terrorized and variously described as savage, half naked, uncivilized, primitive, hill and forest tribes, primitive tribes, backward Hindus, and most recently as indigenous peoples by Persian Sahara. Tribes have been studied predominantly from the evolutionist, caste, and nationalist perspective in India. The concept and category of tribes have been theorized from various perspectives and from different theoretical locations. For instance, the theories that dominated during the 19th century was evolutionism. The dominant theories include Morgan, Marx, and Durkheim. They conceptualized tribes in an evolutionary framework and based on the principle of successive life of evolution. In India, with the establishment of the Asiatic Society of Bengal in 1734, there have been general walks and communities in India that later came to be called <coughs> tribes. The leading scholars during this period are Dalton, who wrote a book called Descriptive Ethnology of Bengal in 1872. Recently wrote on tribes and castes of Bengal in 1891. Kirsten, castes and tribes of southern India in 1949. The 19th century ethnographic view of tribes argued that the term referred to what a particular type of society based on kinship ties and stage of evolution. At the dawn of the 20th century, tribes were just a box with the race of the Indian nationalism and caste centric theories existing together with British colonialism. This is well reflected on scholarly scholarship during this period of time. Scholars and administrators alike did not give serious effort to delineate tribes from caste. Hence, tribes have been seen as a natural equivalent of caste. A contrast has been drawn between tribes and caste and even change among tribes as primarily studied in terms of a transformation into caste. The tribe caste continuum has been reinforced in the post independent tribal studies by Hindu nationalists. 
Once a scholar is none other than G.S. Gore, who categorized Adivasi or tribe as backward Hindus. Due to their incomplete absorption into mainstream Hindu civilization. Tata termed this the denial of difference approach. However, there was an attempt to define tribe on the basis of one religious practice. For instance, the 1901 and 1911 census reports added that categories so-called enemism to the list of gods and others in the census. Thus, it is interesting to note that tribals are were identified as those who practice animism and those who practice illusions are categorized as gods. Some of the broad characteristics of tribe features that were used to classify or categorize tribe in India include backwardness, living in inaccessible places, speaking tribal dialect, practicing animism, self-governance, outside state and civilization. Tribes in India are thus defined not so much in terms of coherent and well-defined criteria, but in terms of the administrative classification that divides the population into tribal and non-tribal or caste or non-caste society. They are treated as those groups enumerated in the constitutions in the list of scheduled tribe. The debates among sociologists and social anthropologists in the 1930s on the question of tribes in India subsequently shaped in the form of isolation versus assimilation and integrations in the 1930s. Or one's goal as cultural paradigms to security paradigms. The protagonists who advocated the policy of isolation for tribes were none was none other than Alvin. His book, The Baga, published in 1939, became the basis policy framework of isolationist approach for tribes in India. However, when it comes to tribes in Northeast, Elvin in 1964 advocated for integrationist approach and asserted structural difference between Hindus and the tribal and recommended sensitive state policies for protecting the latter. On the other hand, G.S. Gure advocated policy of assimilation for tribes. He argued that tribes were Hindu but to put it more bluntly backward Hindus. He thought of tribes as inferior Backward identified them as standing a step lower to the all on the evolutionary ladder, and in fact not being very different from the mass of the Indian population. He posited that tribes should be assimilated into the larger society so that they could be lifted out of an abject property and base living condition. Bodhi and Zozo in their forthcoming book argue that the theoretical historical view of isolation integration and assimilation in many in class society that lay the ground roots of debate burdening to tribal societies is not as innocuous as it seems. Isolation, integration and assimilation of tribes or class society is often perceived as freedom, negotiation and adaptation by those friends of tribal societies respectively. The theories which uh, stems from 1960s, 70s, both manifested policy in the form of protection of cultural distinctiveness as envisaged in the fifth and sixth shift of the constitutions of India. By 1974, with the introduction of travel sub plan, the dimension of development was added to policy framework. However, the theoretical framework of civilizational evolutionism continues to dominate even during this period with the class society seen as a civilized war and tribe as an uncivilized periphery. For instance, Andre Betty articulated that tribe exists outside the ambit of civilization and the state. This gives the perspective of all existing approach which tribe <coughs> consider to be a product of history. Alex, you are not The remand of this theory still persists in the form of subalternity and evolutionism. Bodhi of 2017 argued that the current dominant theoretical framework 
has, has found that tribes under rigid veil of colonial threats. Over the year, much conceptual brutality has been dominated by the likes of Esiroy, G.S. Gore, and Kebos, and Kepete, and a string of other upper class, uh, upper class social anthropologists who try to lock Adivasi or tribes within a subterranean sub Brahminical framework that infantilizes non class societies. The universality of colonial Western European knowledge became a powerful colonial tool that its application produces most of the some of the most horrendous events in its history to this very day on the category of tribes in India. This framework is being perpetuated by the dominant class epistemologies and tribes are entangled within this pervasive class society. For many indigenous societies across the world, this specific reference to tribes or Adivasi in India, it begins with the characterizations of such societies as people without writing in the 16th centuries, to people without history in the 18th and 19th century, followed by people without development. And most recently, right to the early 20th century, as people without democracy, Ross Rubble, 2011. It is interesting to note the critics of the colonial and class framework on tribes and new theories frame around the perspective and discourse. What? That is what the tribal intellectual collective in India call as perspective from within. Which gives an alternative framework to comprehend tribal social reality from the wave, from the framework waves of colonialism. In this context, Tata argues for the need to shift in perspective about the study of tribe, where he reiterated that the terms of reference for study of tribes in India should not be caste, patient, or social heterogeneity, but rather group or regional community, for example, Bengali, Assamese, or Gujarati. For him, a tribe is not a mere social cultural community, rather, a tribe is a whole society like any other society with their own language, territory, culture, customs, and so on. Hence, as society, tribes must be compared with other societies and not with us, as has been the case in sociological and anthropological writings. Going from this perspective, Bodhi Yasser and Nanka posted that by tribes we mean not only a social cultural entity, as conceived by most anthropologists, but also a political, historical entity. It is neither a class nor a peasant group, and neither it is a stratified grouping, which in due course of time will lose its sense of itself in the sea of class reality and hierarchy. Tribes in India have a social structure, which is different from that of so-called mainstream society. Here the term tribes have been used not in the definitional sense, but as a category opposed to that of class, a pervasive feature of the larger Indian society. The use of the term tribes from with certain difficulties in India as tends to generalize communities that are quite different from each other in respect to language, culture, tradition, custom, and so on. Amidst these differences, Kata draws up one commonality of tribes in India, that is, exclusion from many social groupings that have historically, socially, and culturally been associated with India. The challenge before us is that, till today, we are looking at the world in the image, the mirror created by someone else. I'm experiencing the world through the looking glass. This is problematic and it doesn't unravel our social reality. If we want to see the world, we have to have our own looking glass and create a space from the organic historical context. Thus, epistemology is the key for tribal emancipation. How do we problematize this? Here, I would like to state the positions of tribal intellectual collective India on a few key epistemological considerations which are fundamental to tribal and Adivasi theorizing. They are the need to posit epistemological premises 
that challenges gender and class stratification within tribe and Adivasi society in the light of increased complexities, fragmentation and social inequality arising within each tribe or Adivasi society across the country. That their need to produce knowledge that does not in any way, either consciously or by default, are thrown the further operation of Dalit societies across the land and brand of Indian society. The imperative of not producing knowledge that invisibilizes, silence or immobilize small tribes of Adivasi society. And the gear that must be taken on militarizing development in the life of states, current development paradigms, which are framed in such a way that tribe of Adivasi displacement and destruction are seen as necessary for national economic this stemming from a dominant misconception that tribes of Adivasi are mere object for necessary alteration rather than a thinking, reflecting subject <coughs> of historical drive over their land, culture, and territory. This perspective gives space for respectful engagement across swift community boundaries, yet propel researchers to search, locate, and position themselves around the ability to apply the point of view friendly grounded from within rather than without. The observations of body on violent political historical gap between the Indian state and the tribe is interesting to note. The manifest situation unfortunately is the violent political historical gap that already existed between the Indian state and tribe or otherwise peoples. The end result of this is problematic, characterized by brutal impositions of the state framework on Adivasi realities, being the disconnect, deprivation, and further estrangement of Adivasis from Indian state, coupled with wrenching subjective distortions of Adivasi lived reality. This is related in many ways to the subjective alienation and felt loss of common our what they conceive to be naturally endowed resources and a culturally embedded lived world. The politics of dominance, the denial of rights and historical injustice by the dominant class community of our tribes in India has led to various forms of articulation by tribes and one such articulation is by the tribal intellectual collective India of the common perspective of the way. Tribes in India are caught in dichotomy between the state's view of development and usage and the versions of development. They continue to live in a colonized state, even in post independence in India. In fact, they are experiencing what Kaka called two forms of colonialism. One at the, hands, at the hands of the British and other at the hands of the now tribal Indian population. And I would like to conclude by reiterating what Tata has done. Tribes are not merely at the margin, but possibly even outside the margin of Indian national identity. Thank you so much.